Jim, this question for the late night drive through comes from Rob K in Rhode Island. Hi, Mr. Cornette, big fan of your podcast and of you personally. I had no idea how interesting the regional days of wrestling were. Great to hear about this amazing time in American culture. My question is about the pay structure during the territory days. Let's say Jim Crockett promotion played the Springfield Athletic Complex and pulled in $10,000 at the gate. What portion of that could the headliner expect? The promoter, some opening jobber. Again, thanks for the great podcast and history. Bobby Eaton, I think, said it best. When's the last time you heard that said? Bobby Eaton (laughs) said it best when he said the formula for the promoters paying the boys is they put all the money in a big basket and they throw it up in the air and whatever sticks to the ceiling, the boys get. Um, But in in all seriousness and – this formula, like for exact, for example, Sam Muchnick in St. Louis followed a formula, and it was the old time wrestling formula that, that predated a lot of the territories, where the main event got the vast majority of the money because they, it was figured they sold the tickets, and then the supporting card uh, split up a smaller percentage. But he was strict with it and fair with it. To the point where Dick the Bruiser one time said, if, if Sam owed you $606.25, there'd be the fucking, you know, uh, quarter in the envelope. Uh, so the main event in, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s for a big house in St. Louis for the NWA world title was between four and $6,000 each for each guy. And the next best paid guy on the card might make a thousand or twelve hundred. And then the opening match guys would make two hundred and thirty seven dollars fifty cents because much he would take a certain amount uh, most often quoted as about thirty five percent of the gate for the show. And that was to pay the wrestlers. And he would take sixty six percent of that thirty five percent and split it amongst the two guys in the main event. And then he would uh, pay the semifinal guys and the special attractions, Andre the Giant, whatever the fuck, uh, a nice payoff. And the preliminary guys would split up the rest. So that's why there was that wide range. With Crockett, it was in my book, The Midnight Express Scrapbook, how under oath in a deposition, he tried to explain how he paid the boys. None of our math that we've been able to, to do has, has borne this up, but <laughs> supposedly, He would take uh, 33% of the gate, and he would divide that 33% of the gate up amongst the talent, figuring guys in main events, and usually there was more than one main event, double or triple main events in the Carolina Territory, would get a large percentage of that, and the underneath guys would get succeedingly less with a bare minimum of $50. But I think that since you bear in mind that they always took care of guys they were wanting to push and they always wanted to encourage people that they didn't want to push to fucking find some place to go. And there were homesteaders and favorites that got taken care of sometimes better than guys who might actually have been drawing some of the house in some places, which led to people leaving and going elsewhere. Uh, And there was always the promoter's discretion of whether to run the house through the separator first or not, so that what the actual house was may not be the house by the time it gets back to the office. So with all that saying, I think Bobby Eaton's formula is probably the most mathematically correct. Did Jerry Jarrett or Bill Watts or I guess even Fritz when you were there use a formula or was it just they paid what they wanted? Well, I mean, you know, once again, it was technically there was a formula and I'm sure they could have showed you some kind of formula that would have closely approximated it. But at the, at the time, also a lot of these guys, they just had a feeling they knew how to take care of guys. They knew what a guy would consider being taken care of with some guys might've been, should have making 12 or $1,300, but they, the promoters knew they'd be happy with a grand a week. They were over for some reason in that territory, whereas they wouldn't get over or get a chance at that level anywhere else. And they so but other guys you had to entice not to leave because they had options. Some guys you could take advantage of because they were there. And the boys, when they worked regular territory towns after a couple of months of going to these towns weekly or bi weekly and seeing the varieties of house and where you got paid and whatever part on the card, I could always kind of determine what our payoffs were going to be. Example in, in Mid South, when we first started getting the groove of it down there. Bobby Eaton would be in the ring with a hold on a guy and I'd look around at the house and I'd, I'd lean on my, my hand on my chin and I'd hold up two fingers against my cheek. And that meant, okay, payoff tonight's probably about 200 bucks. 
and Bobby would keep the hold. But if I was leaning there and I had all five of my fingers up, that meant, yeah, we're going to make about 500 bucks tonight. And he'd get up and do a spot. But if it was a big show like Houston or Oak City or the Superdome or whatever, and if with the other hand, I was leaning on my chin and I held up a one, which meant a grand or two, which meant two grand, he'd get up and goddamn start getting juice and going through the wildest bunch of bullshit you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> You had, you know, you had your stages there, but you could figure what the fucking payoff was going to be based on what kind of payoffs you'd gotten that town before. And then when things went south, then, you know, you knew when to, to fucking quit or give your notice or whatever. <clears throat> and also, uh, uh, when we were in Mid-South, the Oklahoma City payoff, even though the house was always bigger, would also be a lot more generous than the Tulsa payoff. Because I think the rumor was he was taking some of the office expenses out of Tulsa. So there's a little bit left, uh, less money left for the boys in that town. So much has been said throughout the years about Sam Mushnick and his formula and his method for paying, especially his main eventers, as you talked about earlier. What about Paul Bosch? How did he treat you? Um, well, at the time, Paul had, had, had given over the rights of payoffs that when I was there to Bill Watts because it was it, Houston wrestling at that time was a part of Mid-South Wrestling. Watts had bought 30% and he'd incorporated. Paul was ready to, to, he was close enough to being ready to retire that one of the reasons he sold a, a piece to buy, to Paul uh, to Bill Watts but stayed in the business was that way he didn't have to work with talent and he didn't have to deal with talent's crises and he didn't have to worry about booking. He could just run the town and he was that was his coast into retirement. But Paul Bosch was a similar payoff guy in that <clears throat> especially in the days before the Von Eric kids took off and after Fritz was really had had cooled off in Dallas for about a eight or ten year period there between the mid 70s and the early 80s uh, Dallas wasn't a big money territory Houston was the big payoff of the week when the Dallas uh, booking office guys would get booked into Houston they'd make as much money there in one night working for Paul Bosch as they would working for Fritz the rest of the week because the houses were ten times what they were in Dallas well, not 10, maybe five. 